nobody was talking about him. The story is true. You should hold back. This is All Hell Can't Stop Us, my weekly podcast slash vlog slash record of what's going on. And this is a bit of a gone show show uh, because the this week has been particularly busy for me out here in Thunder Bay. I have all kinds of interesting things going on, but not a lot on the radio side. You may have noticed that normally I have my show available on YouTube and I said that I'd have it available on Mega and that did not happen this week. This is the first week out of I think 11 weeks so far that the only place you could have found it was Facebook which is kind of unfortunate. Facebook is really not a good platform for this kind of thing. They have this really nasty tendency of removing people based on the content of their politics which Uh, is kind of unfortunate but we have a show today so i have a song for you as usual uh this is as far as i can tell a creative commons song unfortunately the the intro to it was in italian and i do not speak any italian at all so i don't know who this is by or the exact cc license i do know that it is under a copyleft license i know you're supposed to technically have the name of the artist included when you share this particular song again i don't know it all i know is it's from gnu funk radio uh which is a defunct radio station so you can't even go and ask them about it anymore and so gnu funk played all kinds of cool stuff uh, a lot of funky music a lot of kind of independent pretty common stuff on that station once upon a time and i happened to record it uh which was of course permissible at the time But unfortunately, just the way that the technology worked, the name didn't go through. So I'll play this song here. If anyone knows who this is or can tell me, I'd love to hear it because I kind of like this song. I'd like to hear more from this artist, and I'm sure other people listening right now would too. So let's give it a spin. When you go out of your I'm scared to pick the phone and answer to you now. I know you take to fly. I often run. Into your tired, naked arms You've got everything There's hidden care The less you are with them The more you take your Yeah. Hey. 
Somebody, if you do, please let me know. I think it kind of reminds me of Jethro Tull a little bit. It's kind of a, got that 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 beat and that that organ sound to it. Uh, so I, I, I like it anyway. Uh, so as usual, uh, this is your alternative to the MPAA, Netflix, and the RIAA, uh, a way to break free your brain, uh, to snatch it back and not be a zombie. Hopefully, a little bit. And I have an update of something I talked about on one of the previous shows, uh, which is that as I was kind of reading the uh, indictment against Julian Assange, uh, or at least excerpts from it, they pointed out that it wasn't actually uh, the Espionage Act that Assange was being tried under, and that there was all kinds of kind of uh, wiggling around the Espionage Act, and it seemed like the evidence was there for an Espionage Act charge, but the act wasn't actually mentioned. And so there was kind of that level of relief that, oh, well, at least he can't be executed for his crimes as a spy under the Espionage Act. That is the punishment allowed. So it seemed for a moment 
like there was some good news, at least in the silver lining of the cloud of Assange disappearing into the prison system in the U.S. for torture and other things. However, uh, going from the World Socialist website, WSWS.org, quote, headline, legal experts, Assange likely faces espionage charges if extradited to the U.S. Quote, a CNN report last week revealing that the U.S. Justice Department expects to bring additional charges, quote unquote, against Julian Assange, has underscored the immense dangers confronting the WikiLeaks founder after he was illegally arrested by British police at the Ecuador's London Embassy at on April 11th. Pause. So the World Socialist website does not hold their punches on, on a lot of things. Uh, they have their own bias, I'm sure. Uh, but you can count on them to at least be a little bit more honest when they say stuff like that. Anyway, continuing on. Assange was arrested on bogus bail charges to facilitate an extradition request by the U.S. administration of President Donald Trump. CNN cited legal, U.S. legal scholar, scholar Orrin Kerr, who bluntly stated that the two publicly revealed U.S. charges against Assange, alleging, or alleging he was involved in a conspiracy to gain unauthorized access to a U.S. government computer, were, quote, a placeholder. Kerr said that they were only, quote, a brief indictment sufficient to get the case started, but very likely only a small part of any case against Assange. Peter Torn, a former computer crimes federal prosecutor, said, quote, the government does not limit an indictment, especially in a case like the, this, to a single count. It's better practice for the government to bring a multi-count indictment. Many legal experts have noted the threadbare character of the charges. They revolve around an unverified 2010 chat log alleging documenting a converse, or allegedly documenting a conversation between Assange and U.S. Army whistleblower Chelsea Manning. U.S. Pr prosecutors claim the logs demonstrate that Manning sought out Assange's assistance in cracking a hash or password. This would have enabled her to access Defense Department computer networks on a password that was not her own, thereby helping to protect her anonymity. There is no evidence in the indictment against Assange of, on, or a supporting affidavit from an FBI special agent indicating that the password was ever broken. Moreover, as an Army intelligence analyst, Manning already had authorized, authorized access to all of the material she could provide to WikiLeaks. James C. Goodale, who served as general counsel to the New York Times during the Pentagon Papers case in the 1970s, wrote in The Hill that the indictment of Assange was, quote, a snare and delusion, unquote. Goodell stated that, quote, it seems to have been written off with a particular purpose in mind to extradite Assange from England. Once he's here, he'll be hit, no doubt, with multiple charges. Pause. So just to give a little bit of context on that, usually how the U.S. justice system works is they'll throw a whole bunch of charges at you to get you to plead guilty to something. And they'll offer you some kind of a deal that you get, you plead guilty to X, Y, and Z. You'll get so much time, so much punishment, but if you don't agree to this, you face significantly more of a threat. And it can actually be a, a really significant amount that they can threaten with. And they'll just keep adding charges if the evidence suggests that the, the charges might in any case stick. And the, I can't remember the exact number, but it's something like a 99% success rate. Once you get to the point where they're charging you with something, that that charge is going to stick. And so it's, it's a really, the, the setup there is really in favor of the government. Uh, and they're being able to to make uh, charges and have them stick. So continuing on, the espionage has historically been recognized as a political offense. At the end of World War I, it was used to incarcerate socialist leader Eugene Debs amid a growing revolutionary movement of the international working class. In 1971, the U.S. administration of Richard Nixon unsuccessfully sought to employ the provisions in the act to prevent the New York Times from publishing further material from the Pentagon Papers, which revealed the scope of U.S. war crimes in Vietnam. The government lost the case on the grounds that its demand violated the First Amendment protections of the U.S. Constitution. It is likely that the initial U.S. indictment has been narrowly limited to computer hacking charges in order to avoid defense arguments that Assange faces prosecution in the U.S. for, quote, political offenses, unquote, and to ensure his speedy extradition. The affidavit against Assange accompanying this indictment, however, incorporates language directly from the U.S. Espionage Act. It states that, quote, Manning and Assange have reason to believe that public discourse, disclosures of the Afghanistan war reports, pause, again, I've read those, so there's there was nothing in them that the disclosure at the time really threatened anything. It was a historical document. All of the, the information 
was not threatening to current operations at all. And they've never, to my knowledge, really proven that that would even be the case. So this is like recording history and, and providing history, and that in itself would be espionage. Anyway, continuing. And Iraq war reports would cause injury to the United States, quote unquote. Uh, the, most of the reason why it would uh, cause injury to the United States is because the U.S. government has killed its own allies uh, on quote unquote blue on blue attacks, mistakes, regrettable mistakes, where U.S. military, for whatever reason, uh, the fog of war happens, and sometimes people accidentally kill the, the people that they're not trying to kill, as opposed to the people that they're trying to kill, as opposed to the people who they went to Afghanistan to kill, as opposed to people who may in any way, shape, or form threaten the United States, etc. And there were cases of, I, I don't remember the, the exact details off the top of my head, but blue on blue attacks where people died. And at the time, those attacks weren't necessarily always reported in the, the media, especially reported as blue on blue U.S. government killing allies attacks. It happened. That was a fact of history, a fact of history that the Afghan war logs provided to us to detail and give exact details uh, on how much that was happening and to, to allow perhaps a public policy, or at least to give the public a, an option to have some kind of a public policy change regarding the war, war in general, the risk of certain kinds of operations, etc. that they would be able to take a look at and say, is it maybe the next war? Should we go into a war? If, if we know for, for certain that there's this rate of blue on blue death. So that's something that the public can only really consider when it has the data in front of it, which WikiLeaks gave it. So continuing on, this latter phrase is featured in the Espionage Act. Significantly, the affidavit was filed by Special Agent Megan Brown, who said that she was involved with the U.S. investigation of Assange while working for the FBI in, quote, counter-espionage squad. Goodell warned, quote, references to conspiracy under the Espionage Act in the Assange indictment raise the question of whether the U.S. government is going for a bait and switch. Get Assange past the English courts, quote, where there is at least some level of protection against things like torture, things like being sent to the United States where you'll face cruel and unusual punishment, where you could be sent to the United States only to be killed. The, U the UK court system does have, as the UK parliament did argue on the day of the Assange arrest, some degree of rule of law and some degree of protections of people who are charged with crimes to face a fair trial and face a just punishment, not including being executed. So if the U.S. gets Assange past the U.S. or the English courts with this bullshit charge and then gets them gets him to the States and then kills him, then that, that may be how they do it. So anyway, continuing on. And to the United States only to charge him then with espionage when he is in, on American soil. The former US, New York Times lawyer stated that under extradition law, an individual, quote, cannot be prosecuted for any offense other than that which the surrounding country agreed to extradite. There is an exemption, though, if further charges are, quote, based on the same facts as the offense for which extradition was granted. In other words, espionage charges could potentially be laid against Assange, or Assange in the U.S. if they were presented as an upgrading of computer hacking offenses. Kevin Gostola, a U.S. journalist, quote, noted on Shadow Proof that Brown's affidavit also contains references to WikiLeaks publications on Afghanistan as, quote, aiding the enemy. It claimed that WikiLeaks publications were found on Osama bin Laden's Pakistani compound after a 2011 raid by U.S. Special Forces. Quote, there was a lot of stuff on his computer, and it wasn't necessarily special that he would have that. Everyone had the Afghan war logs at that time. It was a popular file to have, and so it's not necessarily useful to him. There wasn't any evidence that just because he had the file that he made use of it at any period of time. So continuing on. As he commented, this is of no greater significance than if Al-Qaeda leader had had copies of the New York Times in his possession. Gastola added, however, that, quote, the mention of Bin Laden raid is notable because it formed a key part of the, quote, aiding the enemy, quote, case that the military prosecutors put forward in the court-martial against Manning in 2013. However, Denise Lind, the military judge who presided over the trial, found that Manning was not guilty of, quote, aiding the enemy. Last week's CNN report stated that the Justice Department was continuing to investigate WikiLeaks. Assange's contacts, including journalists, have reportedly been approached by the representatives of the government. There appear to be different focuses of the investigation, aimed at securing, for, securing further charges against the WikiLeaks founder. 
They may include, quote, the illegal detention of Chelsea Manning by the Trump administration, aimed at forcing her to give perjured testimony against Assange. The courageous whistleblower has refused to participate in this illegal travesty. The prosecution of Joshua Schultz, a former CIA contractor. He has been accused of leaking a trove of CIA documents, known as Vault 7, to WikiLeaks. Pause. I haven't gone through Vault 7 yet. WikiLeaks has kind of released so much stuff that even I, who have spent like hundreds of hours going through it, I can't keep up. Like the Vault 7 is just completely new to me. I keep hearing like little bits and pieces about it, and there's some mind-blowing stuff in it if you care to look through it. But again, I just haven't had time. So it's interesting that uh, the CIA has as much going on as it, it does, and the Vault 7 is just like a little glimpse into that. Uh, but uh, yeah, just by all means, go check it out because it's, it's an interesting uh, leak. Anyway, continuing on. They exposed the global computer hacking and espionage operations of the agency. Schultz, who was charged last June, has been held in solitary confinement for at least a year. Holy shit, I didn't even know that. Uh, solitary confinement for anything close to a year is insane. Like, that is going to permanently fuck his brain up. Uh, that that right there is, is, is torture. You can't put someone in solitary confinement for that long. And the fact that they're doing it to him, like, th this guy isn't... A threat. He's he's a whistleblower. He's he's a white collar CIA government agent a whistleblower. The the only reason that you could even put someone like that in solitary is if you're afraid of him. So it's it's that's a really bizarre thing to hear, but not altogether uh, unforeseen. I'm sure they're doing the same thing to Manning, and when they get Assange, they'll probably do the same thing to him. Uh, it's very scary uh, their their power that they have there, and that they are willing to wield it when you start making waves like that. So anyway, continuing. Protesting against the conditions imposed upon him, Schulte, according to the CNN, declared before federal court this month that, quote, time was up and, quote, the investigation was over. The presiding judge said, said that he was wrong. Search warrants in this case are sealed, indicating a possible attempt to conco concoct charges against Assange over Vault 7. The, ins the entirely unsubstantiated claims that emails published in 2016 by WikiLeaks were, quote, hacked, unquote, by Russian intelligence, which may be. Like, it, it's entirely possible that WikiLeaks receive stuff from Russian intelligence. I don't think they're really all that picky of who they get data from. In fact, Secure, or Secure Drop uh, and similar systems that WikiLeaks uses are built specifically to prevent them to, from knowing who they are getting information from. They are just willing to accept information and give it to the public. Anyway, quote, the material exposed by the National Democratic Committee had rigged the Democrat, or that, the DNC, had rigged the Democratic Party primaries against the self-declared, quote, socialist, Bernie Sanders, in favor of Hillary Clinton, whose secret speeches to Wall Street banks, also published by WikiLeaks, made clear she was a hand-picked representative of the corporate elite. No evidence has ever been provided that the emails obtained or were obtained by the Russian state. Moreover, WikiLeaks' publication of the material, whose accuracy has never been denied, was clearly in the public interest. The allegations were repeated, however, in the Mueller report into the alleged collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia released last week. Whatever the charges Assange faces, they will be aimed at criminalizing the journalistic exposures published by WikiLeaks and setting a precedent for preventing illegal or preventing media organizations from reporting on government crimes and illegality. And that's about all I want to kind of go through on that. Uh, but the, the point here is that it is entirely possible that the espionage may in fact be used. Regardless of what the charges are now, they could change. And so that's that's something that we're going to have to keep an eye on. We'll have to keep an eye on, I don't know if there's something like Can Lee uh, in, in the UK. There probably is. Uh, so if somebody knows what that is, uh, please let me know. And let me know if the uh, Assange case transcripts are public, because I would definitely read them. So... Anyway, that, that's the, the first uh, thing going on this week. The second thing going on this week is I have been taking care of a puppy, actually two puppies, uh, for uh, with my girlfriend, uh, Jen, and for the Northern Critters in Need uh, is where the puppies came from. They were two cute little dogs, uh, but uh, over the week we were successfully able to find people to adopt them. And so they now have forever homes. And I have a little bit of free time again to do things like put this podcast together. Hooray. It did take a lot of my time, but it, it is a little bit of a rewarding thing to know that these two dogs 
very cute puppies uh, were taken care of. It did take a lot out of me, and it was kind of hard to give them away, right? You, you form an emotional attachment to these dogs, and uh, you, you really don't want to, to part with them. It's really hard to, 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 to let them go. I don't think human beings were really evolved to form emotional attachments and then have to break them in such an abrupt way, uh, but that is kind of life. But uh, Northern Critters in Need still has animals that they are rescuing uh, to this week. I'm just checking out their Facebook page right now. They have this Chavez uh, with a cute little puppy dog eyes so that's staring at you. And uh, let's see what else they got. I think Devo is still the dog I used to foster a couple of weeks ago, is still open for adoption. He is in Sault Ste. Marie, but I'm sure anywhere in the world, uh, as long as they can kind of verify that you are going to provide them with a safe home, I'm sure it's probably more difficult the further away from Northwest Ontario you get, uh, but just any anything uh, to give these poor, poor animals a home that would be certainly appreciated. So I'm going to provide a link to Northern Critters in Need at some point uh, when I post this, uh, but I just wanted to mention that they are out there uh, saving dogs from uh, bad situations up here in Northwestern Ontario, and they can use uh, more people adopting puppies, uh, and especially the really cute puppies. I mean, they're cute puppies. How can you not want your own cute puppy? Uh, at least until they pee all over the floor, but that's neither here nor there. So what else happened this week? Uh, well, again, may maybe not this week, but over the past couple of months, uh, one of the things that I haven't really talked about all that much yet is the encryption law in Australia that was passed. And so I've got an article here from Gizmodo, quote, the internet reacts to Australia's anti-encryption bill, quote, Earlier today, Australia's House of Representatives passed the Assistance and Access Bill, which is also known as the Anti-Encryption Bill, or the AA Bill. Uh, concerns over the rushed bill are high, especially as the parliamentary year draws to a close. Today's amendments have done little to clarify specifics around the potential power of the bill that would give the government and law enforcement over... I think they missed a power here. That would give the bill... That, or that the bill could give government and law enforcement over digital privacy and non-digital privacy. I'll just point that out. Uh, and they certainly don't address the impact that the adding backdoor security access could have on the Australian tech economy on the global scale, especially if you take the European Union's strict GDPR or general data protection regulation laws into consideration. While the bill can still be blocked in the Senate, I don't think that's true anymore. Uh, quote, Australian Twitter has been quite vocal over today's proceedings, especially in regards to the ALP's involvement. And so we have kind of one example, uh, not in Australia, but one of the commenters, quote, from Swift on Security, wow, this AA bill over in Australia is a real shit show, isn't it? Good luck to all those half-assed backdoor or firmware backdoors vendors we'll just insert for, quote, just in the Australia version. I'm sure they'll be tested just fine. Uh, LMAO quote what about us uh, this is from Asher Wolf who is pretty cool uh, if you are still on Twitter uh, definitely give her a follow uh, quote what about the Australian tech startups under AA bill their products will be fucking worthless under the AA bill completely unable to be exported or used in the EU backdoor software isn't compatible with the GDPR which is exactly the point if you're using any software especially proprietary software that's made in Australia run uninstall it, do not put that thing on your computer. If it's free and open source software, it is still probably worth making sure that at least one person of some kind of uh, knowledge or skill in the programming language it's written in, it has actually gone through and verified that the code doesn't include a backdoor and that the compiler used to compile it was not located in Australia. Because right now, under the AA bill, the government can come up to you and say, you are going to put a backdoor in this program, and you're not going to tell anyone, and you have to put it in or we'll throw you in jail. And that's the power that the Australian government has seen fit to, to give itself. And this is also a power that the Canadian government is also wanting to have. Australia is one of the five eyes. 
and the intelligence agencies uh, that work together around the world to compromise our right to privacy. Canada is another one of the Five Eyes, and it is a joint Five Eye project to get bills like this passed. And they are going to wait a little while for the flames to die down on the Australia's a case before proposing it in one of the other five eyes. But they're probably going to propose it in a country like Canada first, because we're a smaller country. They, they don't have to ha expend the political capital to get it passed in the States if they can get it passed here in the UK, which is also probably pretty close to next. Um, the UK is probably, they're not pro proposing it quite yet because they're still having trouble with Brexit. Uh, so they may wait until those, those flames die down before proposing it. So again, it may come here next. This is something that could very well come to Canada where the government could require backdoors, require our software to be insecure. The way that the Australian government talks about it is they're worried not just about the end-to-end -end encrypted stuff, not just about the WhatsApps and the Instagrams and the signals and the telegrams of the world. They're worried about, quote, HTTPS. Uh, quote from Swift on security again. Wow, there's a senator up there talking about how 90% 90, how 90 of internet communications are encrypted, and that's a problem. HTTPS. They're talking about HTTPS. Oh, load. Load? Lord. Hmm. Anyway, it's, this is the, the basis which the modern internet is not even able to be secure, but just able to function. We need HTTPS to, be, to keep man-in-the-middle attacks from being commonplace to keep internet banking from being possible. And don't kid yourself, this would also apply to Bitcoin and cryptocurrency solutions to the online banking and finance problems as well. So having backdoors in everything by law also means that not just the government, but attackers who understand the, the government's technology stack will probably be able to use them. Uh, as Swift on Securities kind of pointing out, the, the firmware level is not something that's going to be updatable and upgradable in an easy way. We're having enough trouble securing the basic computer you know, computer systems around us without a mandated legal uh, path for an attacker to come in and compromise your systems. So uh, this is a really terrible thing that has happened down in Australia. And it is going to come here. The battle is going to come here. They're going to try to make it illegal to, to, to ref, not just refuse the government uh, when they come telling you to put the back door in, but they'll try to make it illegal to even teach others how to secure themselves. They will try to ban math itself. The, the math that allows for crypto to work, that is the sort of thing that you don't need all that much once you have that math working uh, to write the code. If they can't ban the math, they'll ban the code or the tools that allow you to implement that math in code. Things like GDB, things like your debuggers, things like your GCC, your compilers, things that allow you to take ideas and put them into your computer and to have your computer run what you desire rather than what the government desires. It's a, going to wind up being a, a direct attack on free software, and this battle is coming, so be ready for it. So uh, that's one thing that's kind of going on. What's another thing here? We've got, uh, th this one's, uh, I, I just saw today. It's from uh, a couple of weeks ago. Let's see if this is going to load. I think I have it in one of my tabs here, but I've got so many tabs. So, so many tabs. Why is this not loading? And this is from The Guardian. Quote, unprecedented U.S. flood season will imperil 200 million people, experts warn. Two-thirds of the lower 48 U.S. states will have a heightened risk until May, NOAA forecast says after severe flooding in the Midwest. So again, this is until May. So we are now in May. Maybe this has passed, but it's, it's interesting to note in any case, the severe flooding in the American Midwest is set only to be a prelude to unprecedented levels of flooding across the US in the coming months that will imperil 200 million people, federal government scientists have warned. Nearly two thirds of the lower 48 states will have a heightened risk of flooding until May. Again, until May. So. Um, it, it's just worth pointing this out because 200 million people being threatened by floods is not a normal thing. But this is a, a fact of climate change. A, this may very well be an 11 year cycle at being uh, optimistic that the US from about the very tip of the border near Thunder Bay to just about the Manitoba Saskatchewan border going all the way down to Texas uh, to Florida and then all the way up the eastern seaboard is going to be subject to uh, possible floods. Now, 
again, I haven't heard very much from the, the past couple of months as far as whether they did in fact flood, but it's interesting to note that this is uh, a threat that was that was even possible. Where would 200 million Americans even go if they all flooded at once? That's, I think that's kind of a good question because how many of them will come here if, if the entire Eastern seaboard floods? That, that's, that's a question we should be thinking about at this point which kind of sets the stage for the last thing I kind of want to bring up here, which is the carbon tax. Now, in order to stop floods like that from becoming commonplace, we could start to address climate change and start to cut our CO2 emissions a little bit as a, as a world. And especially the level of big institutions and governments, but not necessarily at the individual level, certainly a little bit at the individual level, but something like the 50% of the emissions are from the top 10 corporations or something like that. It's, it, the, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but they're pretty pretty bad. And a carbon tax will help with, with that. So quote from the uh, leader post, uh, which again is a little bit biased, but continuing on, the Saskatchewan government is prepared to take its carbon tax fight to the Supreme Court of Canada after a court of appeal decision issued Friday determined that the federal government is within its rights to impose carbon tax upon specific provinces. Three of the five judges who presided over a two-day hearing in Regina said, or in February decided with the federal government, according to the 155-page decision issued Friday. I'm going to try to read this later. Uh, it's probably an interesting read. In any case, here's a closer look at the decision and what happens next. One big question. The crux of the reference case heard in mid-February was the federal government's Greenhouse Gas Pollution, Pollution Pricing Act, introduced into Parliament on March 28, 2018. It came into force three months later, with a fuel, or fuel levy coming into effect on April 1st, 2019. The question before the Court of Appeal was, will this act be unconstitutional in whole or in part? The sole issue before the court is whether Parliament has the constitutional authority to enact the act. This issue is not whether the greenhouse gas pricing should or should not be adopted, or whether the act is effective or fair. Those are questions to be answered by Parliament and by provincial legislatures, not courts. The decision read, the federal government released its pan-Canadian approach to pricing carbon pollution. Again, why are they calling it pollution? That, that, that alone is kind of uh, unfortunate. Anyway, continuing. Which Saskatchewan did not adopt in October 2016. Uh, it proposed a pan-Canadian benchmark for carbon pricing with a carbon pricing rising $10 a year to a maximum of 50 per ton in 2022. And in any case, it's, it's just interesting that, like, it makes sense politically why Saskatchewan would uh, take this to court and waste millions of dollars of taxpayer money to try to prevent probably quite a bit more millions of uh, taxpayer dollars from going to where, where would it go? Oh, it would go back into the province, right? So it's, it's interesting that uh, they would just completely waste this money. But the good news is, is because Saskatchewan did, other provinces like Ontario don't have to do this. They can just sit back and let Saskatchewan spend all the money trying to fight this and wasting it and providing a nice staple case at the Supreme Court level for a carbon tax. They are going to lose this. This, this really doesn't seem like anything they even can win. But the incentives, again, are there for them to try so that they can take something back to their voters and say, well, it's the federal government's fault, not our fault. Your carbon tax has to be fought at the federal level. And that will probably get them more votes on the provincial level. Again, it's, it's politics. Very unfortunate. But the interesting question is here then, what is the Saskatchewan government doing if they're not doing a carbon tax? Are they just completely having their heads stuck in the sand and don't believe that climate change is real? Do they not believe that we could do anything about it? Do they not notice the, the least minimum amount of consensus at the international level regarding action against it? It's, they don't really say very much in the article as far as, quote, well, I guess they say, quote, no climate change deniers here. Whether they were for or against federal carbon pricing, all the parties acknowledged climate change was a real issue. The factual record presented to the court confirms that climate change caused by anthropogenic greenhouse gas, GHG emissions, is one of the great existential issues of our time, wrote Richards. The pressing importance of limiting such emissions is accepted by all the participants in these proceedings. They probably don't uh, aren't that public with that, but that would be interesting to see how much they tell that to their voters. Anyway, uh, the proof of, of or truth of these facts is not at issues. That is, they are proven and true. And so they're going to take it to the Supreme Court. 
and they'll probably lose, but uh, it is the right of the province to at least see have their day in court and waste that money on lawyers. And uh, so what is the, the, the gain here uh, other than for voters in Saskatchewan, for everyone else in Canada to have our Supreme Court rule on this thing? Uh, but it also will signal that at least to uh, the, 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 the legislative and judicial level that Canada is willing to work with the rest of the world on this. And the carbon tax is probably not a perfect system. There, there's going to be flaws in it, and it's going to be worth finding and criticizing those flaws when they come up. But taking it to court like this, not not necessarily the best thing. So in any case, it's it's this has been about as much as the show as I had planned. So let's put something on at the end. Uh, let's see, what are we going to put on here? Uh, I think I'm going to end this episode with a meditation. Well, this should have been loaded earlier. Oh, why isn't this working? Hmm. All right, that's not going to work. All right, so I think I'm just going to end with some of the piano music that I meant to play earlier. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed this episode. Uh, if you enjoyed this, uh, definitely feel free to support it by Villages, Bitcoin, or Subscriber Star. Um, and uh, if you have any suggestions of what to cover in future episodes, definitely send me a message uh, by Ricochet. I'll post the Ricochet address anywhere where this video is posted, hopefully. Uh, and especially Creative Commons music to play. Uh, I'm interested in Creative Commons music and would love to play your favorite. Uh, send a link to me. I'll take and give it a lesson. Um, so hopefully you enjoyed this episode. I'm going to try actually just closing this tab and see you next show.